Hello, can you hear my voice? I think my microphone should be working fine. Okay, great. So it sounds like you can hear my voice, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our usual monthly non-farm payrolls um, preview webinar. Um, we're very excited to, I'm very excited to be joining you this morning. And there's a couple of things I want to talk about in addition to non-farm payrolls, and I think that's you know going to be quite important because it's playing into what's going on in the markets right now. Now, um, I'd like to start by sharing with you my screen. Screen share, let's just do full screen share. Start screen share. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen now. So I want to start by talking a little bit about um, the general price action in the markets because I think it's important to have that context as we go into um, non-farm payrolls. Um, right. This week, the dollar is king. The dollar is bid. Investors like buying U.S. dollars, and so they're quite excited about holding um, the currency going into non-farm um, payroll. So if the dollar had been selling off across the board, I would say that um, even if we got a strong non-farm payrolls report, the impact on the U.S. dollar would have probably been limited. But because we do have... Um, the market buying dollars, or at least you know, there's certainly an appetite for U.S. dollars right now. That that um, we're basically looking at an environment where a good number could actually extend the gains for the U.S. dollar. Non-farm payrolls in general is very important because. Um, Job represents the backbone of the U.S. economy because without jobs, there's no spending, there's no growth. But at the same time, I think everyone realizes that um, even if we had a good jobs number, it's not going to sway the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates um, in June. I think, you know, for the most part, the market's properly discounted no action by um, no action by the Fed in June. And so... With that in mind, you know, there's still probably a limit to how much benefit it will provide for the greenback. Now, if it's going to need to be a very, very strong number in order to get investors thinking one way or the um, other. And I'm not too sure whether we're going to get that report. Now, well, let's take a look at um, the what some of the other labor market indicators for the U.S. tell us and what the market is anticipating. So I'm going to start, this is my Bloomberg screen, I'm going to pull up the U.S. calendar. We'll come back to the charts in a little bit. So first and foremost, you can see the market's not um, expecting a stronger NFP number. They're only looking for 200,000 job growth compared to 215,000 the previous month. Um, unemployment rate, however, they're looking for an improvement and they're looking for steady average hourly earnings. With NFPs, you know, there's so many underlying components that are important to the trade that um, the headline release these days sometimes is, is almost secondary because the unemployment rate and average hourly earnings is key. So let's take a look at what the leading indicators for NFPs tell us. Typically, we have eight leading indicators that we follow. The first one that has just been released this um, morning was jobless claims. So we're going to take a look at the historical statistics for jobless claims. And we can see that, you know, the two four week moving average was the most important in jobless claims actually hit 258,000, which I think is the lowest level that we've seen. Do we have a bump up from the previous week? Oh, we actually had a bump up for the previous week. Um, where can you see the numbers, Alex? Are you not seeing it on my screen? Oops. That was not one. Of, can you can you see my screen with the um, Bloomberg? Please say yes if someone can see my screen. Okay, so Alex, you can find the expectations for um, non-farm payrolls in any calendar. What we're looking at here for yourself, just pull up um, you know the FX three calendars more than sufficient. This is my Bloomberg terminal. It's just easier for me to navigate. Anyway, going back to 
the four-week moving average. So four-week moving average, 258,000 compared to before the last release, 266,000. So a continued improvement. This is the second lowest level that we've seen the four-week moving average since the 1970s. So pretty low level of average weekly jobless claims. So that definitely is conducive for a stronger non-farm payrolls report. Um, Continuing claims, also continuing to fall. The last reading we had was 2.1 million, which compares to 2.18 million the last release. And that, um, let me see if I can get the historical chart here. And let's see if it allows us, I don't think it's going to let us zoom in. But this is also, oh, here, zoom. So this is actually, um, is the lowest release that we've seen. Let me reload this chart. This is the lowest level of continuing claims that we've had pretty much since um, 2000. So pretty significant um, on continuing claims. But the issue is that, as you all know, um, the issue is that low jobless claims and low continuing claims or fewer firings has not necessarily translated with stronger hiring. And even if it has translated stronger hiring, it hasn't necessarily, it hasn't at all translated into stronger spending. And that's really a problem, which is spending and investment by businesses. So people's kind of discounted this um, jobless claims report because it hasn't been a direct correlation to the other releases that we've had. Now, challenger layoff, um, Layoffs, layoffs increased 5.8%, which is less than the previous month. So jobless claims and um, and the challenger job cuts points to stronger payroll growth. Let's see what else we have. Yesterday, we had ADP. ADP, unfortunately, points to weaker. So we've got three items pointing to stronger. ADP dropped from 194 to 156, so it's a weaker number. So one number in favor of a weaker report. ISM, pretty important here. And ISM will look at um, non-manufacturing and manufacturing. And what we're watching is the employment component. 53 compared to 50.3 a month ago. Manufacturing 49.2 compared to 48.1. So we basically have um, Challenger, the two ISMs, jobless claims, and continuing claims pointing to a stronger non-farm payrolls report. So five of them pointing us to a stronger number, one only the ADP pointing to a weaker number. So there's two other indicators that we do look at. And um, the two other indicators are basically the confidence reports. So the UMich, let's see where UMich was. UMich um, dropped from 91 to 89, so that's definitely um, in the negative number camp. And then let's go grab the conference board's figures. So conference board figures, consumer confidence also dropped. So right now we've got five indicators pointing to a stronger non-farm payrolls report and three indicators pointing to a weak one. And, you know, for the most part, um, the most important is obviously non-manufacturing ISM. I'll just show you. Let's see if I can pull back up the non-manufacturing ISM reading. How much of a correlation that there is between that one and the other ones and why this is our most important leading indicator for NFPs. So summary table, employment component. Mm. Actually, let's build the separate chart here. I think I actually have it built already. NFPs. So basically, let me see if I can get the NFP, this one to be a line chart as well. All right, perfect. So, and we're gonna go five years. 
Uh, maybe five years, a little too long. Let's go one year, three years maybe. And you'll see that um, for the most part, there's a pretty good correlation with, of course, NFPs having much more exaggerated moves than the employment component of ISM. So what this suggests to us is that we did have a bump up in the non-manufacturing Factoring employment component of ISM. So it does suggest that we could have an uptick in payrolls. Confidence is also important too, but I would say that confidence is more a measure of um, maybe spending and wages. So basically, what we're looking for with NFPs is we think that the headline number is going to beat maybe 225 or something like that. Um, the unemployment rate, that's tough to judge. Um, we had a bump up previously. Um, I think we'll probably see continue to see uh, either steady number improvement, but average hourly earnings could miss, and um, that's if it misses, that you know would be um, would quite quite a bit of drag on the U.S. dollar. Um, Alex, yes, I mean the Bloomberg terminal costs, you know, basically twenty five hundred dollars a month. So I doubt that you want to be using the same terminal here. You can get roughly the same information free, but with a lot more work, of course. All right. So um, what do we need for the dollar to rise? In order for the dollar to have a very strong move um, and to drive euro back to 112, what we need is A, we need non-farm payrolls to come in 275 or more. We need unemployment rate to drop to 4.9%, and we need average hourly earnings to grow 0.5%. That could be enough to drive dollar all the way down to uh, 112.50 or so. Um, anything short of that, maybe we'll, and we still have you know stronger numbers. We may see do euro dollar at 113.50, but be more of a buy on dip than a sell on rally, especially if you take a look at the euro dollar chart. 113.50 is definitely a bit of a support level for um, euro dollar. Now, on the um, downside, if we have a miss, if basically everything is pretty much in line, unemployment rate, average hourly earnings, non-farm payrolls, and any one of those components miss, we'll probably have a sell-off in the dollar as it would reinforce everyone's um, view that the Federal Reserve is not going to be raising interest rates anytime soon. And you can see uptrend in the euro is still very much intact, even though we have a little bit of a turn here. And so um, it could drive the euro back up towards 114.50, for example. Non-farm payrolls is um, extremely important, but it's not going to be one of those events that creates massive fireworks this month, simply because I think the market's pretty comfortable with their um, view on what the central bank um, is going to do. And it's not as if it's going to be a game changer for the Fed. Even though it's very, if it's strong numbers, um, I think that we'll probably still need to see, um, we'll probably still basically need to see um, two months of good reports in order for, in order for, um, us for the Fed to really change their minds about raising um, interest rates in June. So, you know, that's really the main thing to talk about. So one other thing I want to talk to you about is seasonality. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, you know, or, uh, pretty much the first trading day of the month on Monday, I posted this table here. That was when the dollar was still pretty weak. And I talked about how, you know, seasonality is quite important for the US dollar. I'm sure all of you heard the old saying, um, sell in May and go away, uh, which basically pertains to the stock market, which um, is that, you know, there's an old investment idea that if you sold in May, came back in, uh, in, on November 1st, that um, you know, you'll be much better off because the summer tends to be a very volatile month and equities start to tend to decline. So we tried to take the same thesis and we tried to apply it to um, currencies. And you know, first and foremost, um, first and foremost, uh, it doesn't really work for currencies because if you take the euro, if you sold in May on May first and then um, bought back in November, it's you know 50-50 chance that the euro euro was actually going to rise. Same story with Aussie, same story with dollar yen, although dollar yen has a little bit more of a trend. Same story with the dollar index. However, the whole thesis of sell in May, go away, does work pretty well. If you sell in May and you, uh, you bought back 
at the end of May. So you sold on May first, and you bought back at the end on May thirty first. Eight out of the last ten years, the euro fell quite a bit, actually. In the month of May, and that's exactly what's been happening in the euro right now. We also see a very similar trend in sterling. Sterling hasn't fallen as much, but that could be an opportunity.、Um, and we also see a very similar trend in the dollar index, but in, in, from a different perspective. Where if you bought at the beginning of May and you sold at the end of May, that、um, the dollar index performed very well in May. So、um, this seasonality factor may be contributing to the overall to the moves that we're seeing these days, which is that the dollar tends to perform. Perform very well in the month of May. Other seasonality factors to consider: you could also do the same for Aussie sell in May, but buy back in September because、um, you have to be a little bit more patient. Because by September,、um, that's when you tend to have you know pretty much、uh, you know eight out of the last September's from if you sold in May, bought back in September, that、um, the Aussie actually traded lower. Caddy.、Um, There's also seasonality, but in the sense of dollar cat, if you bought dollar cat in May and you sold in November, that would have been a pretty good trade. So seasonality,、um, of course, changes all the time, but there are factors in May that can affect、um, euro and sterling、uh, from rising, actually drive it lower. And of course, that's、um, the Brexit concerns because Brexit is a serious concern. It is something that、um, everyone's、uh, talking about. But they're dismissing, and I think as we get closer to the referendum, that、um, it could have a much more significant impact、um, and lead to you know the quid you know moving lower、um, this month. So be aware of that、um, because seasonality、uh, can be quite important. I think you know、um, definitely affects the trades. Now taking a step back.、Um, There's a couple things that we think have ha are happening. You know, dollar cad I think is pretty much bottomed. Oil has peaked, so if dollar cad retraces to 128, that's definitely a good buy point for the currency pair.、Um, euro, I wouldn't necessarily. I mean, euro, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's peaked、um, unless we break below 113. Sterling, I'm definitely looking for a deeper pullback towards、um, 143. Dollar yen, that's an interesting one. Dollar yen's.、Um, Rising, and I think it's bottoming. If you sell, you could try to sell 108、um, with the 109 stop. But if it breaks above 108, then it's probably headed to、um, like 108. If it breaks above 108.75, it's probably headed to 110.、Um, dollar CAD. We talked about how it's bottoming. Kiwi dollar.、Um, it's moved into a downtrend. I think that、um, we could see further weakness, especially since the pressure is now on. For the RBNZ to lower interest rates in tandem with the RBA, Aussie also, you know, downtrend. I think we're gonna see, you know, Aussie、uh, come down to seventy four cents. Although seventy four fifty, there's definitely a bit of a support level there. And then dollar Swiss, very strong rally today as Euro dollar saw a very sharp decline.、Um, and I think you know, dollar Swiss also bottomed out here. All right, so、uh, we've talked about you know、um, NFPs, you know, with our members, we live trade NFPs every month with a variety of trading strategies. So I definitely encourage you to、um, consider、uh, our service and joining us because we do that、um, every single month with our members. Otherwise, let's open up the floor to any questions that you may have. Or any charts that you want me to pull up. Pretty quiet group here. Any questions? Why is dollar cad bottoming?、Um, I think you know. First of all, we've seen a turn in Canadian data. I mean that those. Trade numbers、um, from Canada were horrid.、Um, there's a record-breaking trade deficit that was reported、um, by Canada, and then also、um, we are looking forward to weak、um, employment numbers on Friday. And、um, the reason for that、um, is because we had a you know a very strong one the month before, so a correction is definitely anticipated. And then in addition to that. Um, we are beginning to see oil rollover. So I think you know, and oil is all the、um, issues with 
um, supply and demand. I think that's going to continue to play a very big role and have an impact on the currency. Good question. Any other questions? Yes, and of course the dollar rallying in um, in this month, and also that seasonality chart that we saw all point to a possible bottom in dollar CAD. So fundamentals and technicals are there. Technicals also, you see that we've been hugging below the 20-period SMA for pretty much the past um, three and a half months. And for the very first time, we're above it. And that signals quite a significant trend change. We have a significant trend change. It tends to have continuation. <laughs> I don't know if you're burning in Alberta, but definitely seems like it. Um, I'm you now this stuff is really hard to, to predict how, when they can get control over everything, but I'm hoping that'll be soon. Will the Aussie continue higher or has it peaked? I think the Aussie is probably due for a bit more of a correction. I see it coming down to 70, 33, 31. If you look at the monthly chart, we can see that we're just beginning a fall. There's even room to fall all the way down to 70 cents. If you go in the weekly chart, you see that as well. The only thing you have to be wary of is let me drop in this FIB retracement. That's why we were short Aussies. We took some off already. Um, and I don't think that we want to be back in this trade until it breaks below this FIB retracement. If it does, then we're going to see the Aussie much lower um, because it's a significant level. But right now it's holding it. I think WTI is going to go back to 40. I'm a fusion of fundamentals and technicals. It's always been our um, mode of operation, which is to combine fundamentals with technicals. Any other questions or charts you want to look at? This is kind of irrelevant to NFPs, but could you give an opinion on the RBA upcoming announcements? Speculation pushed Aussie higher. I mean, the RBA just eased. Uh, obviously, they're not saying they're going to ease again. I mean, the mean just happened. The next meeting's not until another month. I think that um, it's really going to be up to data. Data's been mixed, um, but Chinese data has been great. And so, um, you know, I think it's really about, because there's such a big gap between now and the next meeting, um, the focus will really be on the employment numbers, which I think um, are coming out. Um, well, actually, we don't even have them out anytime soon. They're coming out um, at the end of the uh, middle of the month on the 18th, and that's really the main focus. Any other questions? Again, regarding sell in May and buy October, can you um, extend on it? I mean, it's really the numbers speak for themselves, which is sell in May and buying back on November 1st only works in dollar CAD and um, and everything else. You can always you can look at this, you know, um, on my website, bksmanagement.com. Everything else, like what we're looking for right now is sell euros and pounds in May and buy back at the end of the month. But we're already beginning to see the moves happen. If, you, if you're not following me on Twitter or bksmanagement.com, you didn't catch um, the first moves. You would have if you caught it, if you read the piece when it came out. But um, right now, you know, you just, uh, the moves are beginning to happen. Although Sterling um, is only beginning to move.
It's just because of summer volatility more than anything else. I feel like I'm bombarding you with questions, but could you give me analysis on Euro Kiwi? Sure. So Euro Kiwi obviously down a lot. Um, I think that you know it's it's fading the same place it faded before, right around 168. Euro's falling, Kiwi's not falling as much. Um, I think that I think that we're going to see um, further weakness in Euro Kiwi, at least to 160, um, at least to 161. One, I said 164. Any other questions? Okay, so if there's no additional questions, I'd like um, to thank all of you for joining me this morning. And as I said, Kathy Lean FX, that's my Twitter handle. Follow me there if I've got you know, these things such as seasonality, um, central bank previews. I'm uh, posting about them when I find them interesting. I'll post a little bit. I'll post that summary of the NFP um, preview that I had when I'm done with it. And um, I think that it's pretty valuable to at least follow me on Twitter. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Talk to you later.